You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Today we're talking about enough uh, what, how do you define enough when you reach a goal that you've been striving for for ages? Are you slowing down and soaking it in and enjoying the moment? Or are you rushing on to the next task on your to-do list or the next goal to go after? I'm going to be talking about that today in quite a lot of detail. Um, I've got some copious notes that I've been making and thinking about this subject. So I will talk about that momentarily. Before I do so, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online, an ongoing um, sponsor of the show. And uh, essentially, BetterHelp is is online therapy. Um, therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes Therapy, the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. Now, I've had some amazing conversations with people over the years that have massively helped. I think that in order to really make progress and move beyond anxiety, we need to get support from other people and and getting it out of you. Um, journaling is also great, but speaking to another human being is the ultimate, right? It's the best one. Everybody deserves to feel at their best. Um, better help makes it easier to get started. So they've, they've matched millions of people, um, with professionally licensed and vetted therapists, hundred percent online. You can do it with video. You can do it with audio only. There's no waiting rooms, there's no traffic, no searching for the right therapist online. Cause you can change as well if you want. So learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash anxiety podcast. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash anxiety podcast. There we go. Thank you to BetterHelp for continuing to support me and the show. Now, if you want other stuff, you can go to anxietypodcast.com. On there, you'll find uh, the End Anxiety Toolkit, which is something that uh, you get for free. There's also a course on there with some videos that is for free. Um, Yeah, I got some other things I'm working on for the new year. I got some projects I might do over the the holidays um, with a new course for next year. But you know, more on that in the future. The inspiration for today's episode came from just a simple old Facebook post where I saw somebody talking about enoughness. And I I experienced this in myself in a deep way all the time, you know, based on where I'm at in my life and, um, you know, things that I am pursuing and going after and things that I've been able to achieve and then moved on to the next thing is kind of like a a never-ending conveyor belt of um, achievements. And that there's a kind of um, metaphor of, you know, climbing the mountain and you slog your way up the mountain and it's really hard and it's raining and rocks fall down and it's cold at nighttime. You get to the top of the mountain, you're like, finally, I've arrived. And then you look over into the distance and you realize there's another mountain and it's bigger than the one you're on top of. And now you want to climb that one. Um, And I think part of it is our human desire to continue to strive and do better and attain more and get more resources and acquire more stuff, right? We're just going through Black Friday, Cyber Monday, into the Christmas holidays. Everybody's buying stuff, seemingly. And so... We're hardwired that way, which is why it's very difficult to resist the advertisements and the discounts and buy it today and time's running out and all those, you know, scarcity tactics, because that's how we're wired. We're wired to acquire more stuff. We're wired to eat more food because at times of starvation and not enough resources, when we do find food, we as much as we possibly can do, which in a world we live in of hyper palatable, sugar based, high fructose corn syrup cakes and whatever else. Um, it's not good for us because, you know, it used to be that we'd eat, you know, leaves and (laughs) not, maybe not leaves, but we'd eat, you know, things in the wild, which would be, uh, not hyper palatable. So don't taste amazing. Uh, and not as nutritionally dense as dense as we find today. So anyway, that's just a, a bit of a sort of preamble into, um, talking about this enough topic. And I want to just give a shout out to Ryan Holiday, um, world famous author of things like ego is the enemy, um, and the obstacle is the way. Um, 
I met him once at a uh, sort of entrepreneurial mastermind retreat, and uh, we actually went and shot shotguns interesting like like clay pigeon shooting or skeet shooting as it's sometimes called but anyway i didn't know, really know who he was then and he certainly didn't know who i was but um he writes some good books he's a very good author he also has a lot of information out there on stoicism the daily stoic podcast is fantastic i listen to that regularly so anyway he's a he's a you know a very uh well I think very well sort of earthed person and with that stoic philosophy, it certainly makes you uh, prioritize what's important in life. I've talked about that many times in the past, the memento more, the fact that we are, um, you know, only here for a certain amount of time and we're definitely going to die at some point. And you can interpret that as being sort of morbid and, and scary, or you can interpret, interpret it as a beautiful gift to live in the present and to do things now and to say things now and to have difficult conversations and, and get done what we want to do. So, Somebody mentioned it on Facebook. I was reading the comments of that post. He uh, he didn't post it. Somebody said, oh, you should check out Ryan Holiday's article on Enough. And so this episode is a sort of combination of reading his information, which is why I wanted to um, give him a shout out. I'll put a link to that Medium post in the notes. So if you want to read the thing in its entirety, you can do. Um, but yeah, it's just a combination of my own personal experiences and some of that stuff I've read and kind of piecing it all together. So... With that said, six minutes in, I'll get to the point. So here we go. Do you do you ever really arrive at your destination? And, and this is introspective. Some of these questions are certainly for myself because I'm in the throes of this on an ongoing basis. Um, do you ever really arrive at your destination? Do you ever get somewhere and say, I've made it. This is all I ever wanted. I can now um, relax into this beautiful life I've created or this situation I've created and, uh, and be fine with it and be good with it, you know, and, um, and, you know, not necessarily put your feet up because that implies like permanent relaxation, which is not, uh, a desirable state anyway, because we need to keep moving and doing things. But do you ever really arrive and be like, and I, I'm sure there are people out there who have achieved this. They've, you know, they've had, you know, uh, whether it's education-based success or or a health-based success or financial success, they sold a company, they sold their company for $5 million, they got enough money to last them the rest of their lives, they're happy, and now they just live. They live based on, you know, they get up in the morning, have a lovely cup of tea, they go for a walk, they play tennis, they swim in the pool, they meet with friends, they've got a rich social life, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, they're content with that. They don't need to say, right... Uh, and this may be on the more common side is right. I sold a company for 5 million, which is great, but I'm going to start another one because I want to sell one for 50 million. That's what I'm going for. That's the next goal. That's pretty typical response of human nature. And, and a lot of entrepreneurs that I've seen is they're not really satisfied. They just go on and do something, try and do something bigger and better. Right. Dreams come true sometimes. And then at the same time, they're coming true. We create another dream. We, we dream for something. We wish for something. We pray for something. We desire something. We lust after it. And then when it starts arriving, potentially even when it's in the mail, so to speak, as in you've almost achieved it, you start thinking, hang on a minute, I didn't dream big enough or I don't like this dream anymore. I want to trade it in for a new dream. We do that. I do that myself. Um, I had, and I've, I've written a list of things that I dreamed about, which I'm going to share with you and dreamed about them in my sleep and also in my awake state. <laughs> I don't know the right way to say that. In my conscious state. Um, when I was a young man and I first started playing hockey, ice hockey, um, I, you don't say ice hockey in Canada because everybody assumes that hockey is ice hockey, but in other parts of the world, people say ice hockey. So I'll say it. Um, I know I've got lots of wonderful listeners in the United States and you, you have ice hockey, but it's not necessarily your favorite sport. Uh, although lots of people like it, you also have obviously football, NFL, although football around the rest of the world is what you would call soccer. So that I know that debate's currently going on. So we've got the World Cup on. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. I had the dream of making it to, onto my local men's hockey team when I was a young man, when I was like 13 years old. Um, interesting story. I signed up for, uh, something in, 
in the UK called the St. John's Ambulance. I think it's beyond the UK as well, but basically it's like the Red Cross first aid. I used to dress up in this outfit and I would go to, you know, the ice rink and on a Friday night and a Saturday night, they'd be playing disco music and people skating around. And obviously people would fall over and cut themselves and bruise themselves and they need, you know, an ice pack on their knee or something, uh, a band-aid or a plaster for their hand. Um, and so I used to go and sit in this little room with this old uh, old guy who was the sort of head man and uh, people would come in with their injuries and we would patch them up and put a sling on them and send them out. And then the exciting things we get to do is at the actual match day, game day of the, the men's team, which was semi-professional. Some people got paid, some people didn't. There's maybe, you know, 500 to 1,000 people in the crowd. I, little Timmy, would get to stand on the end of the bench in my first aid gear in case, I don't know what, what I was going to do if somebody got seriously injured, but I was there and, uh, you know, I had a little, some bandages and, and stuff like that, but we would be a presence and stand there either for the crowd or for the players potentially to, to help them out. And at that age, one of my dreams, which which seemed like a ridiculous, wild aspirational dream at the time, because I could barely skate, was thinking I'd love to play for this team. It was my dream to play for that team as all these massive hulking, Canadian guys and people from Russia and Sweden and Finland and they just seemed so cool to me as a kid um, and then I started playing hockey and some years later a different iteration of that team because that team was no more but um, I ended up playing on a men's team in that town and uh, and a few other towns so I kind of made it which was kind of cool that was a dream of mine and then I'll just rattle off a few other dreams I won't go into every single story but um, After that, when I was about 19, I had a dream of playing hockey in Canada, which is, you know, for many people, the home of hockey is Canada. And I thought, right, maybe I could go and play hockey in Canada. And I wrote letters, physical letters back then, sort of, this is 1997, 98. I wrote letters to all these teams saying, oh, I'd love to come and play for your team. Um, I was born in Canada, so I think, you know, I I did have citizenship at that point. Um, But I've been playing in England and I've got British citizenship and blah, blah, blah. Anyway... Uh, I think I got invited to a couple of tryouts, two or three tryouts, but the the city I was born in, beautiful Trenton, Ontario, Canada, um, the general manager, a wonderful man came, uh, named John Gibbons, wrote back to me and, and said, yeah, we'd love to have you come over. Ended up going over, made the team. Another dream came true. Then the dream of meeting a girl. I met a girl. Then the dream of the girl being interested in me. She was. It was hard work. Long, long road for that one. But she was. And now I'm married to her. have been for 22 years. Um, and then after playing hockey, I went back to England and I had a dream of getting this specific type of job. And then I got the job. And when I had the job, I had the dream of getting promoted. And when I got promoted, I had the dream of moving back to Canada and signing an office for the company there. And I did that. And then I had a dream of buying a house. I bought a house. Then I had a dream of selling that house and buying another house. I did that. I had a dream of gaining muscle and and losing weight and getting into shape, getting fit, getting a six pack, all those things. And since then, um, or in conjunction with that, I've had loads of dreams, which I've focused hard on and made come true. And then I've quickly moved on. I think the biggest sort of tangible one for a lot of people is financial success, because with financial success, um, and I, and I talk about this quite a lot, is that, you know, being wealthy, for me, I think the best definition of being wealthy is that um, you have more money than you need, right? And and that doesn't mean you have to have like millions and millions of dollars. It just means that if your monthly expenses, let's say, are $4,000 and you generate $5,000 a month, you're wealthy. You, you've got more than enough money that you need. Now, there's also examples where people's monthly expenses are $25,000 and they only make $20,000. They're not wealthy. They're outspending their income. So wealth is is uh, specific to your situation and your circumstances and what you do with it. You know, people like, when people think of millionaires, they think of the experience of spending a million dollars, not having a million dollars. Because for people that have a million dollars, they don't necessarily show the car and the house and the clothes and the watches and the stuff because they've they've got it in the bank. They haven't spent it. So things aren't always what you what you seem or what as they seem as they appear but it's interesting how with some focus all these things we wish for a lot of the things i've wished for have come true cuz i focus on them you know i get focused on it 
whatever the task is and, the, and then make it happen. So why is it so difficult to attain something and be satisfied? At least take some time to soak it in. And by the way, for this podcast, I don't have all the answers for you, if, if any. I'm just sharing an experience. I'm sharing a point of view. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, sometimes it's kind of like, you know, going to the gym, for instance, is a good one because I talk about this regularly. You can't go to the gym for 10 years, get absolutely jacked with a six pack and then just stop. You haven't arrived. You've just, uh, well, you have arrived, but the journey is ongoing. You're going to have to continue to do things to maintain that, to continue to work out and eat properly. If you get jacked and ripped in a six pack and then you say, right, that's enough of that nonsense i'm gonna go and get a pizza and i'm gonna watch movies indefinitely then you're gonna get revert back to what you were before that's just the way it works and and that sort of atrophy that natural atrophy um is what happens with a lot of things in our life um money as well to some extent if you've if you stop earning money and you don't have a surplus of it to invest and generate an income then it will run out. It's a it's a finite resource. Now, if you invest it and get a return on it through the, be that through dividends or a rental income or something else, then obviously it can keep generating money. That's one of the wonderful things about it and the the the, the wonder of the world that is compound interest. Right? You can generate money from money and put it to work, um, which is why some people say the rich get richer because they you know the more money you got, the more money it creates. It's it's a weird thing. Um, but life moves fast, and if you you know, if you stand still, you get left behind. Or that's how we feel, you know. But I think at the same time, as life moves fast, or, you know, life moves fast, and if you don't keep moving, you stand still. But at the same time, life moves fast, and if you don't enjoy it, then it'll be over as well, right? You regret at the end of your life. I wish I'd just taken time to appreciate that relationship, that you know, situation, that house I had or that environment I lived in or that country I lived in or, you know, whatever it is, do you stop and appreciate it? It might be a reward where you do the gym thing and you get to where you want to be and say, right, I'm going to have a day off. I'm going to go and have a nice dinner and celebrate and uh, not worry about it for a day, not worry about anything to do with that for a day. And then you get back on the, the train again. Um, it is strange because you have to commit to things with a, a tremendous amount of tenacity to really achieve anything in your life, whether that's, you know, your schooling education or your career based aspirations of promotions and um, pay rises or, you know, international travel or a relationship. You have to commit. You have to be serious. You have to try hard. You have to brush your teeth and put a shirt on sometimes and smile and engage with people and all things that can be difficult to do at times. Um, but, you know, th those things take time and mental effort to attain and then you know often we get them and we quickly drift off into the next the next thing i'm trying to move my papers here quietly because i know they'll sound loud on the audio but it's too late i've already done it now um perhaps the ultimate of all these things is retiring you know retiring from your job and, and i think about this a lot because i'm middle-aged and that's what we middle ages think about um and I come across an increasing number of people who get retired and they're not happy. Which always strikes me as strange or has struck me as strange historically. You've been working at this for ages. You've finally attained it. You've got enough money in the bank to live off for the rest of your life and you're not happy. Now, some people are. I know lots of people who, you know, they go to... Mexico for the winter or, or, you know, Costa Rica or Panama or somewhere nice and warm. And then in the summertime, they come back up to America or Canada and enjoy the summer up here. And that's great. And it works well for them. They're happy, sit on the beach, drink a mojito, read the newspaper, go for a walk, um, you know, do their various bits and bobs and they're fine. But I know there's other people, quite driven people potentially who retire and they're just like, right, I don't have now any identity because a lot of people's identity is wrapped up in their careers and I don't really have any purpose. Like, what's the point of getting out of bed? What's the point of brushing my teeth or brushing my hair or getting dressed? Like, there's no nothing to do. Maybe financially, you already have enough, but, and some people just keep working more just in case. I just collect a few more. I'm, I'm a squirrel and I'm just going to go and get a few more nuts and put them in the tree in case, you know, to, you know, in case winter follows winter and there is no spring. Then what happens? Not enough nuts. Get more nuts. Um, and that's how us humans behave is it seems successful people are infinite, infinitely sort of 
um, comparing themselves uh, to other people. And, and as you go up in peer groups, you then compare yourself to a different peer group. Um, one of the wonderful comments about enoughness comes from this story, um, which I may have read on the podcast before, but I don't care. I'm reading it again. I'm going to read it every week. No, I'm not, but I'm going to read it today. The writers Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller were at a glamorous party outside New York City. Standing in the palatial second home of the billionaire host, Vonnegut began to needle his friend. He described the exchange in a poem published in The New Yorker in 2005. I said, Joe, how does it make you feel to know that our host today, only yesterday, may have made more money than your novel Catch-22 has earned in its entire history? And Joe said, I've got something he can never have. And I said, what on earth could that be, Joe? And Joe said, the knowledge that I've got enough. And that's the story. Uh, you know, that's a, a story of, of, I think, a lot of parallels where there may be people out there. There are people out there in the world living simpler lives with less material resources who are happier because they don't worry about the peer groups of billionaires and and neither do I and probably neither do you because there's not many out there but um but you may worry about other peer groups in terms of the neighborhood you live in or the place where you work etc cetera, etc cetera, which you're trying to to live up to another key point from the Ryan Holiday wrote in his blog was sort of the emotional feeling of comparing the stillness that comes from a sense of enough that everything's fine to having to do, 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 go, 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 more, 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 create, create, create. There's a lot of pressure behind that. And it's, it gets tiring, right? This is why people have sort of burnouts and meltdowns and stuff, because they, they just keep going. And, you know, the weird thing is, is that when your physical and mental health is on the line, you know, career progress and promotions and money are kind of all, all of old, a load of old bollocks. Nobody care. You don't care about that when you're sick. It's just, I just want to feel better. All the other things sort of go out the window. So the question then comes, can you create and do things from a place of love without the pressure of goals and outcomes or without having to always do more? I think you can, although I also think it's a little bit industry specific. Like if you're a musician or a writer, you know, the writer in that story went on to write other books. He wasn't finished. He just already had enough. Um, I'm in sales. So I think in sales, you can you can serve customers from a place of love and respect and all the rest of it. But at the same time, there's also minimal acceptable thresholds of communication and, and, and outreach and all that sort of stuff to do and, you know, results to bring in. So, um, it's interesting stuff. And, uh, I'll wrap up with this, this final bit is that, you know, in terms of, um, external versus internal, which is really interesting. So, um, and this is probably why we see a lot of celebrities in the world who aren't happy and they've achieved everything. Everybody loves them. They got loads of money. They're not happy. How is that possible? The two most important things like uh, adulation and respect and, and um, uh, acknowledgement from our peer group, being accepted and being loved. You would think that's very powerful stuff. And financial resources to do whatever I want, whenever I want, go anywhere I want, in style, got all that money, fame, etc. Still not enough. People aren't happy. They're not happy. Still doesn't work on its own. And um, I think, uh, as he writes in this article, having enough comes from inside. It's an internal feeling of having enough. It's something you create. It can't be a Rolls Royce or a Rolex. It's internal having enough. Feeling like you deserve it. Feeling like it is yours. Not I'm not talking about the things. I'm just saying feel like you deserve that to have enough. Whatever that looks like for you. Um, and there's a Lao Tzu quote in here as well, which says, when you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. And so I believe as this story ends, that there's a lot of people out there who are richer in life than, um, than they are, 
um, they're richer in life than people with more money than them, right? Philip McKernan, previous guest on the podcast, wrote a book called Rich on Paper, Poor on Life, which is kind of the opposite of that, meaning got loads of money, but not very happy. And the flip side of that being, you know, rich on life, poor on paper, well, does it matter? If you're, your needs are met and you're fulfilled and you're happy, then why keep striving for more? As I said, I haven't solved this Rubik's Cube of a conversation for myself. I'm still pondering it and thinking about it, but it's an interesting subject and I wanted to share it with you. I hope you've enjoyed it. And, you know, if you want to give me your feedback, go to anxietypodcast.com, click on the contact page, send me an email, send me a message, let me know what you think. Give me some of your ideas in terms of where you're at. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please go to Spotify, give it a little cheeky five-star review or Apple Podcasts or anywhere else and, and leave a nice written review because I do get those sent to me and I love reading them. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.